For the past three years, we've been exploring what it takes to build a migrant-friendly city, one that welcomes migrants and refugees, celebrates diversity, and can provide practical ways for everyone to contribute fully to our social, civic, and economic strength. To do so, we used four million pounds of funding from Urban Innovative Action, part of the European Regional Development Fund, to create a unique team of organizations delivering grassroots-led projects and activities. We galvanized some very special participants with migrant backgrounds and created real opportunities for them and local companies and communities to get involved. We explored programs that encouraged employment, housing, health and citizenship, using language, skills and grant funding to get things moving. We called it My Friendly Cities. And here's what happened next. We've trained 61 health champions 70 citizen social scientists, 162 citizen journalists, 78 with painting, decorating and DIY skills and qualifications, 131 to gain digital qualifications, 40 social entrepreneurs, 100 plus in maker and 3D modelling skills. Involved in the Health Champion project. The other project I was involved was uh, being trained to be a social entrepreneur. What we have to try to do is really to try to uh, educate migrants on the ground to make the city as little bit as friendly as possible to migrants who arrive in the UK and don't understand their rights. I took part on um, a Wicklow workshop to do uh, painting and decorating. As part of Math Friendly Cities, I was involved in about three projects, Birmingham Health Champions. The second one was with the Math Friendly Cities project in helping small entrepreneurs to, to boost their businesses. But the other one that I'm actually involved in is making sure that refugees and migrants have got a say in the communities that they live in. I'm actually now a community journalist. What do you know? In terms of other achievements, there's the magazine, um, is a team in uh, Migrant Media Lab. We came up with a magazine that people were talking about for weeks and weeks. People are still talking about it. It was uh, building up confidence and learning new skills. Working with different people and meeting new people, I think that's the, one of the biggest achievements. We've delivered 6,500 health messages 253 legal rights health chats, 394 share my language community activities, 72 home makeovers, 1000 plus pieces of upcycled furniture, 114 apprenticeships and job opportunities, 639 English language classes, monthly repair cafes, 21 different resources and publications to support individuals and organisations. Citizen rights presentations to 500 plus schools. Thousands of social media posts. A new online art exhibition. By supporting participants through projects, training and funding, amazing things have happened. I still can't come to come to believe that I'm a journalist. <laughs> Cause before I thought journalists have to have like um, university qualifications and lots of letters behind the names to become a journalist. So this has taught me a lot and opened my eyes to say if there is something you want to do step out of your comfort zone and go and do it. Myself, you bought me some confidence, you know. I know that, uh, you know, sometimes, even though we got English barriers, language barriers, but when people, they do trust you, they say that you can do it, oh, what you've been doing. And she opened us a bit, our mind, myself, opened my mind that I can do it. I learned a lot from my friendly city staff and they supported you in a way to showing you the way, not showing 
we are teaching you what should you do to showing I'm beside you, I'm holding your hand anytime you need, I'm here. It has given me an impression of being a journalist. <laughs> my confidence, they, build, they helped to build my confidence to become a journalist, to write something which other people should read. And whenever I struggle, we discuss in our newsroom and we develop, we help each other the way we can. And I say that this is my next family. We soon understood that a key role for My Friendly Cities was as a catalyst for positive change, as each of these initiatives grew in stature and extended their influence. The Law Centre's role in the My Friendly Cities uh, project is primarily to provide legal health checks to migrants who are part of the project, things that would stop them from being able to fully participate in the project and integrate and settle in the West Midlands ultimately. They, they sorted out my visa and uh, all the issues and then they gave me legal help there. Now I have visa, like all my family, we, ha we have visa now. I'm feeling more confident and I'm feeling independent. And yes, I, I know that there are someone who can help me if I need them. The, the impact it has on me is, it really give me confidence. We are now free. At least we can look for work now. We can do it ourselves. And the children can live good life too. I have uh, immigration issues. And then I contact the Coventry Law Center and they really supported me well. It helped me with my mental health, with my rest of mind. Moving forward to better my life and the life of my baby. I really want to be a nurse. I'm an applicant that need a job and I went in there then, and it helped me all the way through my CV up to the time of employment. One of my biggest achievements in this project is that regardless your background, regardless your qualification, they look into the situation you are, they try as much as possible, get you back on the track. People lost their jobs, people lost their homes, people find themselves on the streets and are rehoused and in conditions which are not really um, worth living. So, and no matter what you do within the project, um, if you deliver furniture, or if you upcycle a piece that uh, later on goes to somebody's home, um, that's, that's all an achievement. The clientele that we work with um, have next to nothing. They provide furniture, uh, anything that um, would be suitable for the client and they can choose, pick and choose what they like to receive. I think probably for a number of years, people who have moved in two tenancies and in two properties, if they come from a background whereby they've got nothing, they've just moved into that empty shell. Now, I think with the work from My Friendly Cities and everything that they're putting into it and the help they're giving us, we're able to provide a home as, a part, as opposed to just four walls. They did home makeovers and um, offered furniture to young people with um, disabilities or who were in some way vulnerable. The impact on the clients, it's been really, really positive because it's helped them to develop um, a safe environment at home. With my friendly CP, um, I have provided language sessions, integrational sessions and skills for work and workshops. I'm proud of all of my participants. I'm proud of their journey, their commitment, brought their hearts out and wanting to improve their language and their life in the UK. I, I have been an ESO student. They helped me to, um, to find a job. In Bulgaria, uh, I, I go to university, I have education, but when I don't speak English, I can use my education and uh, they help me. My English is not very well, so when I joined with the Magdalene Center, it was uh, fantastic for me. I help myself, help my family or my mom because she's illiterate and uh, very, very helpful uh, for me when I started uh, volunteer. My Friendly Cities was determined to create real change that could benefit participants directly and also influence approaches to integration and longer-term regional service delivery policy. 
uh, the diversity of the partnership and the 11 partners is a hugely important aspect of the project. But I think quite early on, we started to recognise that city councils had quite an important role in terms of shaping the legacy within the kind of policy context and, and the local stakeholder context. We've tried to really develop that in Birmingham. Uh, My Friendly Cities were launching the Share My Language part of their project in Birmingham and they were looking for partner organisations who could deliver this idea of language learning but not as a formal let's sit down and learn English but through um, different creative ways of engaging with language, of social contact particularly and developing communities. They funded us in two parts. Our project is consist of uh, uh, people who are asylum and who are coming from different backgrounds. And English is not their first language. The project has benefited a lot of people. Public Health have been really, really keen to get this you know, on board and they've, they've really valued the support from the Health Champions, providing the message to migrant communities. So having that sort of resource available has now implemented a new um, process to really work with um, migrant communities in Wolverhampton. For example, there's a new project in the Pipeworks at the moment as we speak around um, how we can deliver COVID-19 messages to migrant communities and using skills from the Health Champions work to implement that sort of work into a community champion pilot and a project in Wolverhampton. We have learned a lot about our partnership, the project, and our participants in three years. A major and unexpected learning was how we would cope during a pandemic, which impacted resources, delivery platforms and projects, and of course, our participants. When COVID-19 led to a countrywide lockdown, our unique approach to the project, the diverse nature and unique skills of partners and participants alike came to the fore. Because while some projects had to stop, many continued in new ways, on new platforms, led by participants who inspired those around them. The skills that I learned on the social scientist activity really helped me when it came to fighting COVID. Uh, The skills that I learned about going into the community to find where the real problems are, I used that skill and I realized that we had people with no recourse to public funds who needed support. And I was able to find a solution towards that. I did some of the the meetings with my friendly cities and they were updating us on the, the, the COVID situation. And that's how we were able to get that information and share with the, with the people we come across to. Most asylum seekers and refugees are not on benefits. They don't work. Uh, My friendly cities, that uh, grant which they gave me, helped me to buy like things, material. Those who say, oh, I want to join your group, but I don't have cash. They saw their masks for their families, which means they are not going to struggle to get COVID in the street. The housing project is also helping in the fight against COVID, how the system worked, other people were still left outside. So it has helped to fight COVID for, by providing accommodation to people who needed it. The three city councils and eight other project partners have learned a lot along the way about collaborative working, the importance of putting participants at the heart of delivery, and how to flex our work in a pandemic. It hasn't all gone according to plan, and some plans needed to change. Cumbridge City Council has been the project managers for the project across the three cities and organised the coordination of the 11 different partners. It's been very important that 11 disparate, diverse, um, but well-connected partners have Uh, collaborated both together and with participants in the project. The collaborative working on the project has been the most amazing thing. As a result of the project, we've been able to collaborate with organisations, a university, 
wouldn't ordinarily collaborate with and we are stronger and have better strategies in place to support communities as a result. The collaboration on the project has really helped us to test that combination of both top-down and bottom-up approaches. A lot of organizations which do this kind of work, like what my friendly cities have been doing, you find they do different pieces of work and they don't talk to each other. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. But in our partnership, things worked out because we shared information on our activities. We have identified migrants that have got issues with employment, so we've got other partners that we can refer them to. We've identified migrants that have got, um, you know, the need for language skills to help integrate into the community. So we've got the um, My Friendly City Share My Language program that we can refer them to. So the collaboration, it's been the key element what is most important is about the participants being the leaders of change. So the participants, the people that we've worked with, they know best what the issues are in their community. They know best how to tackle these issues. What they've needed from us is access to resources, opportunities to do the work that they know they need to do. And then sometimes they've needed a bit of help overcoming some of the barriers that are in society that make it harder for migrants to achieve success in certain areas. When we're looking for journalists to facilitate our sessions, before we do that, we would ask our participants, what kind of training do you need? We made sure that our training was led by the participants instead of us imposing. Through the courses and the training that we've given, we've made a connection with a lot of people and they come in and you see them and they're quite quiet. And once they start, they realize that they can open up, they can relax and change during the course of our, uh, our training courses. Having helped 16 individuals set up their own social enterprises, which uh, um, just a year on has actually um, created 45 jobs. Um, and also supported 2,361 individuals as a result of the social enterprises that they have created. You know, you have these amazing ideas and you want to do them, but they don't fit the description of what that learner is trying or that what that participant is trying to do and what they want to say. This is about them and this is about their journey. And it's about making sure, again, that adapting to what they want adapting to where they're at most of the stuff that we then did was uh, remotely but we had to make sure that our client base had the tools um, in order to do that unfortunately not all our clients have that kind of technology um, all the resources in order for us to kind of move forward we had to look at their needs how do we make sure that we communicate across the project the impact of COVID-19 and the measures that were in place over lockdown. So the first thing we needed to do was get messages out on our social media channels and our website and share with participants how courses and programmes were affected. Um, many of our participants didn't have this IT skills uh, to be able to continue uh, their journey with English. So in that term, uh, we would have to um, produce a packs that we would deliver to their houses. My Friendly Cities is a learning project. Its main aim, to share learning for future projects and programmes to benefit from. But our ambition has grown as we look to the future. While all projects must come to an end, we have worked hard to embed learning into regional policy making and day-to-day -day services, and to create a platform for other projects to continue and evolve. My hope is that, you know, to use the, the skills of getting here in the UK, even in Africa too, because there also people, they don't know their right. My Friendly City has been really um, a great project, really. Like I said, I really wish that other cities can learn from that. And some of the cases we're dealing with have been referred to me from Manchester, from London, from Bristol, or from Leeds. I was able to develop my research question and I've started working on my PhD now. To see that I'm able to help people 
I'm able to give an information that helps help someone. My achievement as a health champion was to signpost asylum seekers, refugees, migrants. My friendly cities has been a, a form of sanctuary. We've been able to give people a little bit of hope. Somebody came in front of me and he, she wanted to become a nurse, but did not know how to do that. I sat with her, worked with her in terms of a plan, and then today, She's second year doing nursing at university. And it really say to migrants, you have some worth. You are valuable. You can contribute to the development of the country that now you call you, you know, you call your home. Those new partnerships that have um, come together as a result of the project will continue. We are lucky that quite a few of the organisations involved in the project have secured follow-on funding, so there are new initiatives already starting. We've supported 29 social projects with funding and advice, 30 plus projects delivering language-inspired workshops, the rising Global Peace Forum, Coventry Welcome City Festival, the fight against COVID-19 with PPE, child care support and community activities, improved access to higher education for refugees and migrants. We've reached thousands of migrants, hundreds of community service providers, councils and authorities across the UK and Europe, hundreds of NGOs and charities, thousands of local residents, 250 plus employers, We've built a reputation for excellence by being a finalist in the European Innovation in Politics Award 2020 and top 10 in the human rights category. It has been a massive opportunity to test ideas. We've done things through My Friendly Cities that normally as a, a team within the City Council we, we wouldn't have approached. We've learned a lot about what some of the barriers are that people have felt in living in our different communities, but we've also learned a lot about how we can connect better with them. The biggest legacy in this project, I think, for Wolverhampton is the Burnage Factory. We've been able to build that sense of belonging within the refugee community and make them feel part of the city. We see ourselves as being the sort of ambassadors uh, for other large employers and employers generally across the West Midlands region to um, sell the benefits of the programme and get people signed up and um, taking participants and be doing work placements and employment opportunities. I see my my role as having three, three main functions um, in looking at legacy. So the first strand is what is it that the participants have got out of, of what they've done? They take the legacy of what they've done with them. The second one is actual projects which have been very successful which will continue beyond the life of my friendly cities and the third one is opportunity to really shout about what we've done to engage as many key stakeholders to understand what we've done and to take some of it and use it themselves and then the legacy will live on way beyond the life of the my friendly cities project the best legacy that my friendly cities has is the people that we've um, championed up to this point so far because they're going to be movers and shakers and they are going to be the ones that write new policies and they're going to be the ones that have those voices that will be heard. My Grand Friendly City is where um, migrants from whichever background, whichever walks of life you come from, you feel welcome and feel comfortable to live in, in that city among everybody and not have your rights taken away from you and be a useful citizen. They, they sort of like embrace me and they have held my hand. And they held my hand and they are walking with me. They are showing me places. They, they show me they are walking with me which is exactly what a friendly city should be like.
Zero, 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 zero,